uh, in the sense that um, you can, it's, it's lost something on Facebook, so it's not able to do it properly. Um, what I've got to do is now manually go live, um, which I've just done. Um, so we're, we're streaming out on both sides here. Um, so, so yeah, we can just chit chat. I think, you know, for folks who are early, this is like a behind the scenes kind of thing. We're not starting properly until 4, uh, 4 p.m. British summertime. But we have to do this precursor bit um, in order we so we can get the multi streams going. Facebook, by the way, gets hundreds of viewers. I mean, um, the, the original yeah. strategy of creating of getting it in the group was was correct because it actually has something like four times the amount of live viewers than uh, the Crowdcast does. Obviously, because everyone's on Facebook and fewer people are on uh, on Crowdcast. But there we go, worth doing. Yeah, I, I just hope that um, Facebook doesn't cut off. Uh, crowdcast at some point because it looks like they, they, they may want to try and do that which is annoying um but um but there we go why would they they wouldn't do why would they do that before they've got their own version i mean they'll know they, they do they have their, their facebook live they have their own thing it's not the same thing though is it it's not no nah. you, you can't do as many people on that's 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 that's, and... that's the problem you can only do one person but uh, or you go by a mobile mm -hmm. app which is a disaster yeah. Um, so, so yeah, Crowdcast through to Facebook is the way, but hopefully they'll get somewhere. Yeah. Um, anyway, we are hitting 4, 4 p.m. So, um, welcome everybody to Brain Food Live on Air. Um, uh, this is episode 21, I think. Episode 21. So, I think we've got to the point now where we're not stopping these episodes. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep doing them. Um, so, welcome everybody to the show. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Brain Food Live is basically a review show of the content that we shared in the newsletter last week, um, recruiting brainfood.com, uh, who you should all subscribe to, by the way. Um, and I'm joined, as ever, by Brain Food Chief Promoter and my co-host, Adam Gordon from Canada ID. So, Adam, how are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, uh, good, thank you. A little bit stressed because uh, I've only got one day left of work on Monday before going on holiday for a week. So um i've got a lot of things uh, to try and tie up before the end of then but in fact i had a lot of things to tie up before the, before starting brain food so that's it most of them are done yep indeed mate i mean this hour is going to be a, a, a well spent for you anyway i think clear your head you know so you, you're not kind of in in the weeds too much in the operational stuff and you know we can get get to it um holiday where are you going cornwall and nice. the reason, yeah the reason for that is because um uh, my kids are two and two and nearly five and my wife gets really stressed out about the, the the chance of taking them on a flight for more than an hour. So uh, Glasgow to Newquay is one hour. So that's absolutely perfect. So it's the closest place we can go that's likely to be warm. You have you have a one hour radius basically um, for holiday destinations until your kids are how old? I mean, goodness, yeah, uh, yeah. kind of so, quite. Yeah. So so direct south for one hour yeah. is basically Newquay. So that's pretty much the and best option we've got. And mate, from Glasgow, you got nowhere else to go. I mean, if you go west, you're in the sea. You go, you go north, you're in, no in Norway. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're not getting much sun there, are you? No. Um, the only thing is, we're flying with it's Fly B, and I tried to go to the Midlands this week with yep. Fly B, and I and and it was cancelled thirty minutes, twenty five minutes before the flight was due to be can due to be leaving. Twenty five minutes before, so with I'm a bit kids? concerned. No, but well, no, no, that was a business trip oh, this okay. week. Next week with the kids, we're all sitting at the airport. Fly B becomes fly maybe, and I'm not yeah, yeah. using that at all. You obviously got to have plan B, C, and, and D schedule for that. Um, make sure those kids are kind of uh, well distracted in case the worst happens and, yeah. uh, and there's a cancellation. Yeah, um, exactly. Listen, Lee's just, sorry, before we start, Lee's just popped in with a, uh, a, a typical Lee question. Like you, I love Lee Candioli, we love this guy. We have to get him on yeah. at some point. Um, yeah, definitely. Straight away, aren't you concerned about Boris Johnson most likely being your new prime minister? Now, that's irrelevant to everything we're going to be talking about in the next hour. But the answer is yes, absolutely. And Scotland will be independent within the next three years as a result. No doubt. It's the end of the union if Boris Johnson becomes the prime minister. That is probably, I'm, I'm putting my house on that. Um, it's, it's, yeah. It's not quite Trump, though, to be the, fair. No, but he, we're, he's a similar ilk. Um, uh, you know, clearly um, a populist, a, a, a philanderer, a liar. These things are true. Um, he, this is not a political show. Yeah, by the he's, way. He, 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 he can't, do, can't do me for libel on that. It's just absolute fact. He just BSs all the time. So anyway, um, yeah, we're in, we're in bad shape, Lee. That's all I've got to tell you. We're in bad shape. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, let's focus. Let's focus and get back yeah. to the topic, yeah. including brain food. What was interesting for you last week, Adam? Well, um, as you know, when you were off two weeks ago, I did a show about Oleg. Yes. Um, and, you know, we talked about all the reasons why Oleg is probably real. And it's we had Rand, yep. Randy Moore was on and mm -hmm. Christina was on. And they had, like, basically factual evidence that the guy was real. Well, we certainly know that now because he's literally come out and done a video after people begging him and to, to like, come and show himself. Um, uh, so this guy is the, Mar the Mr. Marmite of recruitment, uh, and he's the chief technology officer for the Daily Mail. He, he comments on recruitment, slags off recruiters a lot. I actually like what he says, to be honest, and I think some of it's inspiring for your average worker. Um, but a lot of people hate him. Anyway, he's, uh, he is real. He's done his first video on LinkedIn. It you wasn't... The best it, was a, video, it was a bad video, and I tell you something. I think his his moment in the sun might have gone. I mean, I'm with you on on Oleg. I mean, I think he's he's won the game of LinkedIn. I don't resent him for that. You know, he's figured out how to how to um, you know uh, game the the news feed so that he's always at, he's always there, and he's got millions of, of views as a result of it. What he does with those views, I don't know. Um, uh, but he's a real dude. He's a, he, he's he's managed to figure it out. But LinkedIn know about it, and I think they've actually changed the, their algorithm to stop this type of um, game, game gaming that he's done. And now he's gone to video because he because he knows that video is the next stage. But it's not his strongest medium, you know. Um, well, what, what he does with his, you just said that you just said I don't know what he does with all those all those views and likes and things. I think he just goes home, sits on his easy his like lazy boy, and just smiles. Maybe, yep. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't seem to monetize it. He's not pointing to anything. Um, so so oh, yeah. all, the, all the likes and the comments he gets doesn't seem to go anywhere, um, which is fine, you know. So maybe he's just uh, altruistically doing this. Um, he, he's kind of a, a mature gent as well. So I just wonder whether he's gone to the stage of his career where actually, you know, maybe making all the cash isn't what, he's, what, what his driver is. But there he yeah. is, Oleg. Or he's got his first video out. Check it out. It's in the link I've just shared. Right. Sorry. I know. Well, very last thing about that. Or it is the longest possible preamble for a consulting <laughs> future consulting career ever. He's like playing. years of warm years of warm up <laughs> procrastination. And he wanted to do it five years ago and four years ago. And he's just never done it yet. He's playing yeah. the longest long game ever. But he he's, he's a very yeah. well known guy. I mean, Lee surprises us by saying who 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 the bleep is Oleg. But hey, um, he is there, Lee. I mean, he's the most famous guy in LinkedIn. Surely, check him out. Yeah. Um, okay, so Best. what else? What else is interesting for you, Adam? Best time to send email. Um, so we do a lot of our own data on that, and um, we we've absolutely got three peak times, which are uh, when people are on the way to work at lunchtime, and uh, not when they're on their way home from work, because they tend to just finish, get the office, go to the yeah, office, yeah. and go later, like sort of nine p.m. It goes up, and I think that's when people's kids have gone to bed. But where where, where is this data? You should share this with us. Um, this is brain food material. Um, yeah, we, we will. By the end of this year, we'll, we'll put together some really, really great data on that. But what, what, what that report said was all interesting stuff and all absolutely right. Earlier in is better. You know what? The, th the thing with the report, one thing I think we need to talk, sort of distinguish when we're talking about new, uh, email is what type of email it, 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 is it actually? Um, because this report is about email newsletters. Um, so I think that's a different style of email um, than a transactional email where you're trying to have a one-to-one -one communication. So uh, the, the link I've just shared, if you're setting up a newsletter, which of course I would recommend you do because it's been an amazing journey for me, uh, please go ahead and do it. But that report I've just shared there is worth you reading. Um, because it will give you some indications as to what, when, and how you should send this thing. So, yeah. For, for you, your Sunday morning is a perfect time to be doing it because you're getting people in the evening in Asia Pacific and you're, you're getting them before they get up in, in the USA. But the other the thing is the types of people that are interested in brain food are not people who work to, not people who work for a salary necessarily. It's people who are working because they're doing something they really enjoy. They're also hobbyists and all this stuff they're enthusiasts and you know they talk about it all the time so it was it was a little bit with that psychology as well it was it was, it was a <clears throat> so the timing of the newsletter by the way for people who, who don't know it happens sunday morning every morning uh, in the uk time um and the theory is that's the emptiest time i think people have 
Um, you know, you've had, you've had a big night out, you've had drinks or whatever, you wake up on Sunday, you're probably going to read a paper or have a croissant or something. I want sort of brain food to be the thing you consume um, when you're doing that. Um, so it's kind of good reading time, basically. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's for people who are passionate about this um, and, and see, you know, recruiting is more than just a, a, a job, but something that they're really passionate about getting better and more interested at. So, yep. okay, cool. What else, Adam, uh, was interesting for you last week? Well, I immediately, I immediately wince when I see the term culture fit. Yes. Um, but 10, 10 the, the culture fit interview questions, I'm like, if you're hiring people that have got culture fit, that's probably at the expense of diversity. Right. Uh, diversity of thinking in particular. Right. Mm. That is a very strong comment, uh, but I think it's a pervasive one. It's kind of now prevailing wisdom. But in defense of Hire by Google, who, who wrote this blog, I think they made a very good point about how to handle that. Um, and they did it in a previous sort of post where they defended the concept of cultural fit. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they, they recognized um, uh, sort of that there is a diversity question, but what they wanted was to understand, okay, is this person going to align with the, 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 the values that we have as a business? Um, and I think sometimes that's fair enough. I mean, diversity, we all care. There we go. I think Elizabeth, thank you, Liz. I know. You're going to get that. 99% of the people agree with you, man, on this. But fit, I, I, pants are too tight. I love that. Yeah, I would say I just recommend people read that blog because I think it, it kind of nuances it a little bit more uh, and gives people a little bit more of a flavor. So, okay, uh, moving on. What else, Adam, before we move on to the meat of this topic? <laughs> well, char charging employees for conference rooms helps <laughs> disco boost profit. I'll, I'll, I love this. this. But I wanted to understand it a bit better. I love this. So people... Wait uh, a bit more? Yeah, yeah, I'll explain it because it was my favorite post of last week. Basically, this Japanese company that makes silicon chips, computer chips, um, they're saying something to the effect of, you know what, we're going to completely transform our culture so that everyone in the comp everyone in the business as an employee is operating like an independent business. Yeah. Um, and the company is actually a marketplace where independent businesses exchange value. Um, and so they've got their own internal currency. You have to bid for work. Uh, you know, if you want marketing to look at this, that, or the other, you've got to, you, you've got to, you know, literally treat them as a supplier to you. Yeah. Um, and the theory is, is that it's designed not to waste people's time, to respect your colleagues' time because it's going to cost you some internal currency called will. So anyway, I thought radical experiment. I love it. I don't know what how this company is doing, but you know what? I love the experimentation. And I love the you know where they're pointing towards as a future of of, of organizing work. You know maybe uh, the gov the business is a discrete uh, entity that's separate from the market. Maybe that line is starting to, to 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 kind of gray over a little bit. And the distinction between an external market and internal market it doesn't really make sense so long as the work is being done. So anyway. I once went to a disco in Glasgow where there was clearly no profits because everybody <laughs> was drinking bottled water. And I thought that was, uh, yeah, not a less, good business. No, the less we talk about your nightclub era, the better, I would imagine, Adam. What to um, do with me? <laughs> all right, let's move on to what we're talking about. We're talking about early stage careers today. Um, this is what yep. people have tuned in for. Um, yep. so early stage careers, I can't, I'll make a confession right now. This is something I know nothing about. Um, I've never been a university recruiter. I've never done anything other than experience hiring. So I just wanted, you know, from your side, Adam, like what, what are your like, for thoughts on it? Do you know more than me? Are we both kind of unqualified to talk about this? Well, I, I haven't done an awful lot in this area for quite a long time. But when I, when I worked at the company that's now called Have Us People, I, I did work on uh, some companies' graduate campaigns and, and things like that. And so in terms of uh, the marketing aspects of, of graduate recruitment specifically. I, I used to do quite a lot in that area. And one thing I really enjoyed about it was at the time, I was like 23 years old, so I was only a little bit older than these people. And I knew where they hung out and I knew what their buzzwords were and I knew what they were interested in. And so mm -hmm. I could contribute to campaigns quite well. I, I, don't think I, I don't think I would know so much now. now. I'm 42 years old and I don't really think that I would know what's going on in that world anymore. I watched Love Island the other night and I had to <laughs> like get, get Google out and start translating, you know, getting understanding what all the different phrases meant 
Um, so, so you, you, you don't know what, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah, same as me. I have no idea, which is a good, good job. We've got some amazing guests to help us today. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring the, the white hat, uh, a crew on straight away. So these are people who are going to tell us everything we need to know. Um, so folks, if you don't know white hat, they're, they're, they're awesome. A new company that's been set up by you and Blair and uh, Sophie Edelman. Um, and they're there basically to, to help companies hire apprentices. Um, so these aren't even university folks. These are young people coming out of apprentice schemes. Let's get them into, uh, let's get them into businesses. So, so oh, well, there she well, is. Well, uh, how, you, how are you doing, Sophie? Good, thank you. Let's see whether you and manages to work out how to, to turn it on. Indeed. Oh, I, you know, very it's not complicated, all right? <laughs> Yes, you and Blair, you and Blair can click on an email. He, we've we've so, figured it out. We figured that one out. Some earphones as well from somewhere. I managed to I managed to grab them from one of the team. I'm not well prepared, but uh, there we go. That's <laughs> perfect. Not prepared is perfect preparation, Ewan. So listen, before we kind of launch into the meat of this, I wonder whether one of you two could take the lead a little bit and talk about White Hat. What is it? What do you do? And and and, and what do you do it for? Who do you do it for? Absolutely. So we're a tech company building an outstanding alternative to university. And our mission is basically to create a diverse group of future leaders in an environment where university is becoming more and more expensive. So it's less appealing to young people in and of itself. Employers are often having to retrain graduates how to do things. And then there's this massive lack of diversity in tech and professional services. So we're basically focusing on three things. First, give employers a way of measuring potential that's not just based on work experience and academics. Second, get some of the best applied learning and content from around the world and build into technical and professional apprenticeship programs. And then finally, give our apprentices access to these really thriving on and offline communities that include meetups, socials, sports teams and societies. And then we work with this range of employers like Google, Facebook, Salesforce, BP, Clipper Chance, Warner Brothers, that are brilliant jobs at storing companies that most people assume you have to have gone to university or a great university to get access to. Yeah, I mean, that, that's brilliant. Uh, and on that last point, uh, you and I just want to bring it, bring, bring it to that issue because did, didn't you read that Google, along with Apple, have decided, I think, last week not to actually use university as, as, as a qualification anymore? So yeah. it's kind of going on trend with what you guys are doing, isn't it? Definitely. I think hopefully some of our programs that we've been running have been showing the value of non-graduates. Um, and the great thing about taking on a you know high potential non-graduate is you're basically getting them three years before you would uh, when they leave university. And I'm sure lots of people who are listening have um, have hired graduates who want to you know want a pay rise or a promotion after six months or think they should be the manager. And actually, you don't really get that with with apprentices. Uh, they are, tend to be very grateful for the opportunity they've been given. They, they stay longer on average about four years in the company, so they're much more loyal because they feel the company's really invested in them in their training and they've taken a chance. Um, and we've got uh, about eight apprentices now at White Hat and they are some of the brightest and, and most ambitious people we have in the team. Um, and the companies we work with, I think, feel it the same. That's amazing. I mean, for the folks that are not in the UK and they're kind of wondering what apprentices are, uh, this is an official sort of designation for a person, isn't it? Yes, so an apprentice is a specific category in the UK where it is someone who is doing work for a minimum of 12 months while training. They spend about 20% of their time doing what's known as off-the-job training. And there are a list of specific apprenticeship standards that they can learn their discipline in. So, so hold so, on a second. On. Can, I just, can I just say a couple of things, right? So first of all, I, I'm not going to tell you what company it was, but about three years ago, I was in a room with a group of 10 graduates and I said to them, and they, they were about three or four years after graduating, and I said to them, if, if you had the opportunity to go to university again, would you do it again? Yeah. Not one of them said yes. Not one of them right. said yes, right? Oh. So <clears throat> um, I, I, I've got a personal belief about this and I don't really want to sway the conversation here, but I don't think people should bother going to university unless they are training to be something where you really do need that degree, such as a lawyer, a doctor. Oh, you, you see, can be a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can do, it. You can do an, an apprenticeship with 
all the way up to being a fully qualified um, lawyer. You also um, can do it as Flip an accountant, chance. for example. I think accountancy is a, a, a very good example of where it's always been done. Oh, well, not always been done, but for a very long time. And in fact, um, EY, PwC, all yeah. the kind of big four now take school leavers on their early careers program. And they've actually run the data and they outperform the graduates. So they've stopped, they've stopped calling it like a graduate program. Everyone goes through the same training program, just some people start at 18 and some people start at 21, 22. So if you go to KPMG aged 18, you're a fully qualified chartered accountant by 21 years old. You go to university and then go to KPMG on the graduate program, you're a fully qualified chartered accountant by about 23 or 24. And um, you've got, what is it, in some cases, 50,000 pounds worth of debt and you're paying that back over an incredibly long period of time. So we're seeing more and more young people are looking at this and going, hang on a minute, why am I getting more information about this in school? Because theoretically, this is an incredible opportunity where I can learn something really useful to me, start building my career, and I'm not having to accumulate debt at the very outset, and instead can put that money on my first down payment towards a mortgage or whatever it might be in 10 years' time. Can I, can I just sure. say something? Because Elizabeth mm -hmm. makes a really good point on the chat. Um, about you know the value of growing up, the fact that you go away to university, you have to live out, you have to learn how to to manage your budget and your shopping, and you get this access access to this network and the broader community and all that kind of good stuff. And honestly, that's what I got out of university more than anything else, as as well as sort of the the doors that it opened and the fact I was able to get a job afterwards, um, which not all graduates are now. But um, what we've really tried to do is focus on that piece and say, what's amazing about that university experience, the community. And um, I think I've got an echo, sorry. Um, and we've actually wrapped that around the White Hat Apprentice experience. Maybe you and you could pick up because I've got an echo. I'm going to try and say yeah. no, it out. You might have in your ears, but we, you're not echoing with us. Okay, that's why um, I'm sort of pausing, yeah. echoing in my ears. And I was like, what's going I, on? I, for me, the only reason university was useful was because it taught two, two reasons. The first was it taught me how to write properly. So I did history and politics and it taught me how to structure arguments. Yeah, That was really one of the only reasons. The second reason was because I went to university at 18 with the maturity of a 15 year old and I left mm -hmm. at 22 with the maturity of an 18 year old. So um, it let me percolate a little bit longer before going into the workplace. That was it. There wasn't really anything else. Right. In, in defense of universities, though, I think one, one thing you do get, and, and I want, I want to put, put this to Sophie and Ewan as well, like one of the things that you do get at university is the network, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Because you've got this intense environment. Um, you're, you're typically living away from home. Um, you've got three, four years, however long the course is, and you might end up walking out of there with a bunch of people that are going to be very significant people for you in the future. Um, you can actually see one of the one of the problems of Oxbridge is, is exactly this effect um, because people go to these universities and you know th their mate is going to turn into you know some some digital director somewhere or he's going to enter politics or he's going to be a significant figure at some space and that's going to have tremendous value for you in some way. So I wonder whether we can accept that as a, as one of the strengths of universities versus apprentices. Or uh, you and you're going to pop yeah, in and, and challenge that. So go ahead. So look, first off, we're not anti-university, no. right? This is about giving young people options because at the moment they're leaving school and they're being told you either go to university regardless of whether it's in your best interest. There's a burgeoning mental health crisis in universities because lots of people are there who don't want to be there. And if they're not going to university, they're basically left abandoned and schools give them very little support. But so many of the points you make are absolutely right. I think our apprenticeships, and it's so important when you talk about building a system that can be appropriate for what the future of work needs, are about much more than work and training. So you get access to this really thriving community. I mentioned before the meetups, the socials, our apprentices all get assigned mentors. They get public speaking training. They get media training in some cases. They get taught how to write, how to negotiate alongside the kind of individual discipline they're doing because all, all right. the skills are incredible. You, 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 let me stop you there. Can you, I'm, I'm an 18 year old kid. I know it's hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an 18 year old kid um, and I encounter White Hat for the first time. Can you walk me through my experience of, of, from, from encountering sort of the website? What, what happens to me from there? Sure. So we just to take even a step back, like even before that, how would you even know about White Hat? Because we work with lots of schools, all the school networks, 
Um, we really do a lot around teachers and parent education, and then we do a lot with social media. So you would have heard about White Hat through that, or you might have met one of our apprentice hacktivists. Our apprentices are such huge advocates of apprenticeships. They they want to tell everyone about this. They feel like pioneers. They're going out into the world and, and changing the system. So you'll have heard about that, and you'll go onto the White Hat website, um, and you'll apply, and you'll actually create this digital profile. The challenge for these young people is, what do they have on their CV? Some, some GCSEs, some A-levels. If they haven't gone to a great school, their, their, their results may not be amazing. They may be good for that school, but not you know stellar. They might not have straight A's. They've probably got some work experience. Most of the um, young people we work with have been working all the way through their school years. Um, I know I did lots of bar work, and I worked in a nursing home, and I worked in a factory just to earn some money. And a lot of these young people have done that, or they've volunteered. And we want to be able to showcase the things that make them special, but that aren't focused on academics, like you know they've been part of um, Prince's Trust, or they've done National Citizenship Service, or they've volunteered at a soup kitchen for a number of years. That kind of thing it gives an indication of their conscientiousness, their um, you know their resilience, all these kind of competencies which set people up for success. Um, and then we take them through a vetting and assessment process, really looking at their their competencies, their desires. Um, the things that matter to them in their lives, and we then match them to opportunities. So for them, they don't need to know coming in what they want to do. We actually coach them through that process and help find the right match for them. How long is that process, Sophie? Well, normally it takes about uh, uh, just under a week for them to kind of get to the end of that process from the yep, point okay. that they apply. Um, mm -hmm. If they're actually looking to start an apprenticeship pretty immediately, we've had apprentices go go through the process within seven days and be starting a job the following Monday. Um, cool. That's pretty. It's pretty a rapid process, and you don't have to rely on the academic calendar to do this. And just a, a, sorry, Adam, one more one more question because I'm interested and I'm also ignorant, so I need to sort this out. Um, the um, apprentices that that's not seasonal, is it? Like basically, companies can hire apprentices at any time. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So basically, we are placing apprentices every single week. Now you get some slight spikes as you come to the end of the academic calendar. Mm -hmm. but a typical apprentice we might place could be 19 years old, they left school with A-levels, they've been working in a pub or in retail for the last kind of six, nine months, year while they figure out what it is they want to do. And a lot of these people are incredibly bright, ambitious and talented, but they're never entering companies' recruitment funnels because they're not going through these graduate programs. And so they've been mm -hmm. completely missed out on. And we often hear from employers, well, isn't it, you mentioned, Adam, about maturity. Isn't uh, a graduate going to be more mature than an apprentice? We've had 18-year-olds who've had caring responsibilities from a pretty young age. They've been working from 14. They've tutored a sibling through their GCSEs. The idea that a 21-year-old ancient history grad from Bristol is somehow more mature or better able to contribute to a company than this person is just bogus. All those twenty-one-year-old history grads from Bristol hey, are going to be up in arms. <laughs> that <laughs> that was me. That's, this stuff here. <laughs> That's great. So I can already see the advantage for the employer, right? Like one of the big problems of just like if you're early stage talent and you focus on uh, universities only, obviously you're in a seasonal rhythm where typically you can only hire at a certain massive peak spots. Uh, you're in huge competition, and then it just goes away again. So it, it, imagine sort of doing university recruiting. And, and in fact, we're going to bring on a couple of people who, who uh, other guests who will talk about this. Um, they have this weird kind of resource up, resource down scenario in their TA teams because they, they're, they're, they're crushed into this seasonality um, of hiring at uni uh, levels. So I can already see that this may be an advantage for the uh, on the employer side. Yeah, um, absolutely. The other thing that's an advantage for employers is diversity, right? So actually I posted in the chat that 60% of people on graduate schemes went to private school. So the with with apprenticeships, um, one of the advantages is that people who aren't being put off going to university because of the, the, the debt they'll take on or the fact that maybe they didn't get grades because they didn't go to a great school, um, they actually can access apprenticeships and therefore employers can access them. So for employers, there's a socioeconomic diversity element, but also, as you can imagine, there's a lot of other types of diversity that are cross-cut by socioeconomic diversity, like ethnic diversity. Um, there's also the gender diversity thing. Lots of young, lots of young women, for example, don't take computer science or STEM subjects at A level, so therefore they get cut out of then going on to STEM uh, careers. And actually, with apprenticeships, if you did, you know, if you did history and psychology and maybe, um, you know, uh, and 
I don't know, IT at A level, you or not even IT, that's the wrong thing. But you did something like that at A level, you could go and do a software engineering apprenticeship um, if, if you, a white hat, that's something you could actually do. So you're not cut out in the same way. The biggest problem, and I think it still happens today because I ask young people quite regularly is, <clears throat> do you know what marketing is? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. Do you know what HR is? The answer is no. Do you know what an accountant does? No. It's, you know, that education of what do different professions actually do and what kind of skills does it take to do those? And, you know, an understanding of what might appeal to you from a much, much earlier age is something that's really vital. Right. Absolutely. And look, we set up a free platform, careerhacker.ai, that we'll post in the chat. Parents, teachers, young people can look at it. It's got day in the life stories. It gives case studies from different sectors and what those routes look like. Because it is almost, it, every sector is pretty inscrutable to a young person leaving school where you're not being taught about it, especially if you don't have a parent or family friend or someone else who works in that industry. I remember I started my career in investment banking in Northern Stanley, and we always, always, always over-indexed, of course, on white middle-class men, and it was a massive problem. And one of the core interview questions they were asking was, what goes on in the investment bank, and how well do you understand the world of corporate debt and derivatives? If you're not from a particular type of background, that question is massively skewed against you. And so we do a lot on interview prep and support with our talent team and give them cheat sheets and resources. We call it career hacking, so they can compete with those kids who do have the networks and backgrounds. Can it's someone pull that website up and share it in the chat, please? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, translation is so, so important because if somebody, if I asked somebody when I was like 15 years old, what do you do in an investment bank? and they told me in the day-to-day -day language they use with their colleagues, I'm never going to know what that means. It's, I'm just going to go, next, what else? Let me try and work out something I understand. So really talking in a language that people who have never been in that environment before are going to um, you know, comprehend is, is, a, is something that doesn't happen nearly enough. That's absolutely true. I think okay, when we... Um, oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. No, 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 sorry, I interrupted you, Sophie, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to say, I think that one of the things that um, I know that Rowena's going to talk about later is about sort of young people and, and how you engage with them and how you sort of talk their language. And one of the pieces of research that I personally think has been really profound is the We Are Futures report on emerging adults. Um, if people haven't actually looked at that before, I can post it in the chat, but there's some really amazing insights that uh, they came out with about um, what young people today feel and what they what they think about. And actually, there's, there's a lot about how anxious they are about their careers, how important their careers are to their happiness in the future, the fact that they they feel very fluid in terms of their identity and they want that fluidity in their careers as well. There's some really interesting insights there about that, you know, that generation. Um, so I'll post it in the chat for people to, to look at later. I actually want us to take a little bit of a deeper dive in that topic, um, Sophie, because that's fascinating. Um, uh, because one of the one of the, the kind of the things that I was thinking, Adam and I were talking about before when we launched this show was, you know, what is the validity of generational stereotypes? Um, and we know, of course, you know, the prevailing wisdom now is, okay, you can't call people with a generation of this type, please treat them as human beings. I get it, you know, everyone's a human being. But from your research and your kind of working with young people, typically young people, John, I appreciate what you said in the chat that obviously apprenticeships are open for all age groups. However, and most of them are going to come into that late sort of that era. Uh, what do you see these people want? Um, how do employers become the choice to this new audience? <laughs> Did you guys hear what oh. Hung said there? He's kind of a little bit. I think we lost him a bit. I, all I know is Rowan is getting really I, excited in the chat. I, I think I've lost everyone here. I don't know what happened there. Um, uh, but Adam, I've lost your video. Started, you're, okay now. you're back now. You're back now. I'm back. Okay, so let me just repeat um, uh, for this, um, and, and uh, apologies for this. But essentially, what have you guys learned about you know this younger generation that's coming into the workforce? What it is that they want, and how do employers become an employer of choice to this new audience? Training and development is really crucial for for both millennials and Gen Z. They really care about being invested in, about continuously learning. We all know that the, the careers of the future don't exist today and the skills you need 
uh, probably don't exist today. So they want to have a career path that's both fluid but also stable, and they want to be they want their skills to be continuously developed. Um, so the idea of coming in and learning things in a very practical way and and getting the skills that can be then built on built on are really important to them. Yeah, they also care a lot about values and in particular fairness. It's such an important thing, and Sophie and I often talk about this and in our community. Fairness in many ways is more important to them than equality. They actually think everyone should have equal access to opportunities. Um, they're less obsessed with the kind of equality of outcome piece, and that's really interesting to see the way. Okay, you, you and you, can you unpack that for me? So you're saying that oh. the generation coming up is caring less about equality, but they care about fairness. There's so a difference you, between equality of that? outcome and equality of opportunity. So there's a big mm -hmm. focus on meritocracy, and it's impossible to have an actual meritocracy when not everyone has the same access to opportunities. Mm -hmm. so they're very aware of these issues, and it's something we see a lot of our apprentices want to get involved in activism, they want to talk about unfairness in society, and while they're not political with a big P, they care a lot about social issues, be it things like the environment, or be it things like um, poverty, and I think we find as well that our apprentices are making very serious decisions about their future quite early, and this is reflected by a lot of the young people we meet. Unlike probably the millennials who even as fees increased would sort of go to university without thinking too much about the cost they knew they were there having come through the financial crisis and see the impact that's had they're very very reticent to take on debt we find an increasing amount of them hate the idea of having any kind of debt because they see it as a massive burden and that's something that look you've got lots of emerging boot camp models and other things where they're either saying to young people pay up front to go and learn these skills, or pay and we'll take it out of your paycheck. Being able to offer them a route where they, as the user of the service, don't have to pay is incredibly powerful, and it attracts a much more diverse group of people. That's really interesting. Um, and and I, you know what, I, in, intuitively I agree with everything you've said there, Ewan, um, but I, I just wanted to um, kind of ask you the question, of how do you notice? Like, have, you, have you surveyed this audience? Like, How do they signal that these, these values are there? Sorry, you... So you want me to take this? Yeah, yeah, you take it. So we do, you. Yeah, we do a lot of outreach with our community directly. We survey them regularly. We have an apprentice president and vice president who also bring together different groups within our apprentice community, hold meetups, and ask them questions about what they'd like to see and what issues are important to them. So we have kind of speaker series, for example, where they get to choose what kind of speaker they want to hear come in. Um, we do sessions through our applied platform where they can basically go and contribute on issues that matter to them. An increasing number of our apprentices, we have an apprentice editorial squad, are writing blogs and posting them on LinkedIn about things that they care about, and then they're being distributed through the community. So we built a community where it is increasingly being community-led, we're not trying to centrally control it, and so we let a lot of our apprentices spearhead issues that are personally very important to them. Fantastic. For example, we have uh, a BAME network that's been set up by some of our apprentices, and they go and do they get they get t um, people to come in and talk about what it's like being a BAME professional in in the digital and tech community, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have a bunch of girls, actually about 20, 21 girls, starting our coding boot camp that we put on for free for anyone who wants to learn about software engineering um, for for you know a more diverse community, so that that we can actually get those people into apprenticeships ultimately and those people bring a lot of insights to the table about why they didn't take um, computer science at a level or why they care about um, going into a stem subject and doing a software yep. engineering career indeed indeed this is so fascinating okay let's give you guys a final plug on this i'm an employer or employers are watching this right now um, and they're interested obviously to do all of these things diversify their workforce tap into this hidden uh, pool of talent um, what, where do, what do they need to do? Uh, how much does it cost to work with, with, uh, with White Hat? How does all, all, all the mechanics of that work? So essentially, we charge a recruitment fee when we place an apprentice of mm -hmm. 1,500 pounds, a flat fee. And okay. then if they're a levy paying employer, they pay for all of the training through their levy account. So typically, if they're 70 employees and above, the government sets in an annual payroll of 3 million pounds a year, we contribute to this apprenticeship levy. If they're a smaller organization or a startup, the government will actually cover 95% of the training costs. And additionally, you don't pay national insurance contributions on apprentices you hire under the age of 24. So 
it's actually a really cost-effective way for employers to access incredibly diverse talent. And about half of our apprentices we place have claimed free school meals, 65% are non-white, 7% are from care leave or refugee backgrounds. So this is an incredibly diverse group of people that they can meet. And they come with these training programs that are built to provide them with support and expertise in things like data analysis, software engineering, project management, business operations. This sounds amazing. I mean, I can imagine lots of companies are going to have to sign up to this. Um, so um, let me just uh, share that link with you guys right there. Um, check out that link if you are a guess a UK business right now. So maybe the international expansion is coming out in, 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 in at some point in the roadmap, but UK businesses might want to check this out. Okay. Um, I'm, I know you've been spending a huge amount of time with us today. So thank you very much, Sophie and Ewan. Um, you've got the weekend to get on with, so I don't want to burn any more of your time. Um, uh, great to have you on the show. We'll have to get you back at some of the uh, point to talk about these topics we've touched on. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your contributions. It's been amazing. Thanks guys. Thanks for having us, guys. Take care, everyone. Um, something I really enjoyed hearing Sophie say there was um, <clears throat> when she said um, the apprentices don't uh, turn up. Like she didn't quite slag off graduates, but she basically did. She said apprentices <laughs> don't like six months down the line start demanding pay rises and ask to be the manager. <laughs> Typical. Like a lot of graduates have got a slightly. Um, uh, unrealistic sense of uh, expectations. Yeah, and I think you know maybe that's got something to do with social class as well. I mean, I I, I think a lot of it of that confidence comes from you know that uh, I don't want to use the word entitlement, um, but perhaps if you've been used to sort of constantly being fast tracked, uh, you might have an elevated sense of expectation. Yeah, that's true. And the graduates, let's talk about people that know about graduates. Um, uh, we're going to invite a few more guests on to join us here. Um, so let's see whether Chris Garringer is around. Um, he is in Canada, actually. So he's going to come in and bring us a, a totally different perspective. Um, and I believe that he's got experience with um, internships um, as well as with university recruiting. So I'm going to bring him on. I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring Steve Rothenberg, Rothberg on as well um, because yeah. he's our good friend that has always been um, a supporter of this. And he also runs a platform. So... Oh, there he is. Listen, sorry. Let me just quickly say one other thing, Hung, by the way, go ahead. before we go to Chris. Um, you talked about Oxbridge earlier, but I noticed that St. Andrews is now officially ranked the second top university in the UK. So it, it should is. be St. Oxbridge. Isn't it? Yeah, but I'll tell you what. I mean, I, I, I went to St. Andrews, um, yes. and I noticed it basically the progress of its university went up after I left. Yes. Um, however, <laughs> um, I, I think that it's, you know, universities, some courses are great, some, some are not. So I, I think that um, I'd be interested to know how they do the ranking, to be absolutely honest with you. Not to say that St. Andrews is better or worse than Best any of those parties. other universities, but yeah, it's up there. Anyway, let's welcome these two gents on the show. Um, so, so Steve, I see you there. Uh, Steve Rothberg, how are you doing, sir? Um, I'm great, thanks. Great, and we've just lost Chris, so we're gonna have to bring him back on to some other point. But Steve, can you just introduce uh, yourself real quickly and what, what kind of business you run? Sure, no problem. Um, good, good to see you again, Hong. Hello, Adam. Um, I'm Stephen Rothberg. I'm the founder of College Recruiter. It's a job search site for students and recent graduates of uh, one-year, two-year, and four-year colleges and universities. So in the U.S. and Canada, the higher education system is a little bit different than it is in some other areas of the world. The one-year schools are typically technical and vocational. Two-year schools, we call them uh, community colleges or junior colleges. And then the four-year schools are uh, colleges and universities. You get a bachelor, master's, um, some other uh, degree like that. Um, our customers tend to be um, large employers at higher at scale, Fortune 1000 companies, federal government agencies, um, and others that are hiring dozens or hundreds a year. Amazing. And we've got Chris back, actually. Yes. Um, so Chris Garringer, how are you doing, Chris? Yeah. Good, good. Sorry about that, guys. The video is in and out. I, uh, I live up in the mountains, so that happens from time to time. No worries. Where are you exactly, Chris? Uh, I'm in a tiny little town called uh, Roslyn in British Columbia, so just about 10 minutes across the border, but uh, high elevation. Amazing. Um, so, Chris, um, quick introduction of yourself, uh, who, who you are and what do you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, Chris Garringer, first and foremost. Uh, Adam Hung, thanks for having me. Definitely appreciate it. Um, so I'm a university recruiter uh, through and through. Uh, work for Tesla, work for the likes of Apple, Samsung, VMware, some startups. So I feel like uh, I've been around the industry a while, so much so that 
really kind of uh, started my own company, uh, Internship Authority, where I am consulting uh, students. Uh, so we can dig deeper in that, but that's the uh, 30,000 foot view. I want to dive straight into it. I mean, one of the questions we left Sophie and, and you and on before was how does a company become an employer of choice to this young generation coming through? Um, I mean, is there anything that you're spotting that companies are doing badly that they shouldn't do? Um, and I, 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 what, what are the things that companies should do in order to appeal to this audience? And I'll, I'll come to you with the same question in, in a moment, uh, Steve. But, uh, Chris, you go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Well, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, in dealing with students, I think it kind of, I try personally anyway to make that connection. And we talked earlier a little bit about that apprenticeship and giving options. So what I mean by that is, um, I try to be as genuine as possible. I open myself up, meaning I text them personally from my cell phone. Um, I share content with them directly that I feel like could benefit them um, at any stage of the career. Um, I think what what companies maybe are, are lacking is that piece. You know, they put up their job posting um, and they expect people just to come to them um, without providing additional uh, information for them or just helping and learning. Um, and recruiters, a lot of times, unfortunately, in this space, are just pushing paper back and forth without ever making a true connection with that student and trying to find out what it is that they're really looking for, similarly to the apprenticeship piece that we talked about earlier. So again, I really try to be an open book with them. I try to guide them, even if I can't personally help them. Let's say get into Tesla, for example. I want to, hey, what what can I do to help you on the side to, to make yourself better? Or where can I uh, point you to another company, maybe another recruiting platform, or even this po uh, podcast, webcast, or, or your email, right? So I think there's a lot of personal connection that's lacking in this space right now because companies feel like it's just a commodity. Well, on, on that side, I mean, I totally agree with you, Chris. Uh, actually, Steve, I need to ask you the same question. I mean, do you have anything to add uh, on, uh, on what uh, Chris has just said there? Yeah, wait, what Chris is talking about is really, really great and really, really unusual. Um, I think that the, the vast majority of um, corporate talent acquisition departments are kind of treat the recruiting of university uh, students and recent graduates very much like a slaughterhouse. You're just you're just a number and you're just being pushed through the process. And, you know, if you drop out, then big deal. There's somebody else right behind you. Uh, some of that, I think, has to do with the incentive system. Um, recruiters are largely incentivized to um, get somebody to the point of hire. And then there's very, very little feedback after that, whether that person lasted a day, a year, a decade, whether they're your least productive employees, whether you're the, they're the most productive employees. Um, in a lot of companies, if they're using metrics at all, which most will say they are, but it's, it's quite frankly a lot of bullshit. Um, but if they're using metrics at all, they're typically focused on somewhat meaningless, fo um, such as uh, cost per application or um, God forbid, cost per hire, which I suspect Chris would agree with me. That's yeah. not a valid metric for somebody <laughs> in his position because yeah. as a recruiter, if Chris is not the person who actually hires the person. Right, well, let me, let me just take a quick, if you don't mind, double click on that. I, I think to your point, you're absolutely right in what you're saying on those metrics. I think most of them are just bullshit. Um, one of my goals, right, is to, to make sure that I'm following that candidate all the way through, even post internship into full time. And even if an intern still has two or three more years of university left, I'm still plugging in with them and, and helping them and seeing them through. Because ultimately, honestly, I don't care if they come. Oh, you guys were you guys were agreeing with each other there. So you finished what Chris was just started saying. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, OK, yeah, I want to probably... ask I want to ask a question before I forget it, um, because you mentioned something about um, uh, sort of this mechanized system, you use the word slaughterhouse, and I totally, I totally understood that sort of visual image. Um, <laughs> would it be fair to say that university recruiters have a larger number of requisitions on average than yeah. a, it, it makes sense, right? So that's part of you, so do you know what that number is, uh, Steve? I mean, have you got any it, data on this? Yeah, it varies considerably employer to employer. There's a huge difference between say a startup with 20, 30 employees that are maybe looking to hire one or two computer science grads um, versus an employer that, um, you know, like Amazon that last year, I think they were trying to hire 300,000 people, right? Yeah. You, you just, you, you cannot approach those two things the same and, and, and you shouldn't. Um, you know, if you're hiring somebody like an Amazon is where it's like, hey, I really mm -hmm. hope they're with us for two months during the pre-Christmas lead up and, and they're gonna be moving packages around 
And the people who excel at that and, and are willing to stick it out, then they're going to become supervisors and then they might go into our management training program. That's entirely different than if you're a you know, mechanical engineering go, engineer going to work for Raytheon building missiles. It's just, it, yeah. you can't equate those two things at, at all. Um, but one of the things that really, um, that, that, that Chris said, and it looks like he's back with us too, that that um, maybe he was going to head, head in that direction, is that I suspect that people like him who follow those candidates through their life cycle, um, there's a heck of a lot more work per candidate in, in that approach, but his conversion rates are going to be so much higher and the retention rates are going to be so much higher. You really have to be willing and able to take that long-term view if you're going to take that approach. But if all you care about is getting butts in seats, um, you know, you, you can't get there with a highly personalized approach. And, and so I, I, I wish we had more Chris's um, in, in this industry. Okay. Is, so, is, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, there's a, I presume that you can see there's a big difference in the way that organizations want to treat people because now, I'm, I'm not going to pick out a specific yeah. named organization, but if you think about an accountancy firm, um, you know, most of the graduates they hire or most of the um, young, younger people that they hire are coming in to perform audits. So they're coming in to really like go and check the X number of amount of stock is in a stock room. And they're going to go and do a whole lot of things that, um, you know, experienced professionals wouldn't want to be doing. So a firm like that's almost like a, it's kind of wealth creation scheme. And really, it is a numbers game. There's other organizations for which they are, and, and they're happy with 80% of the people leaving as soon as they've qualified as a chartered accountant. That's the model. That's what they need. If that model was to change and everybody stayed, they'd be in trouble as a firm. So, whereas there's other types of organizations where they actually do want people to come in and stay for 20 years, does that make a big difference as to the way that they treat the recruitment process? Well, it may be different in the UK than it is in the US, but um, one of our long-term and larger clients is Ernst & Young. And, and I'll tell you that what you're describing is not, is not what they're doing here. Uh, it absolutely may be that way in the UK, but if, if Ernst & Young hires you, first of all, their cost per hire is, is way more than the average of $4,500 um, that you see in the US for, for students who are higher on campus. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they're at Twelve to fifteen thousand dollars for per cost per hire. They're not taking elite students from elite schools and sticking them into a stock room, can't, counting cans on a shelf. Um, th these are their these are their management consultants. Um, my wife actually, um, in sort of in a former life, she worked for PwC. Oh, sorry, KPMG. Oh, she'll kill me for that one. Um, and uh, I, I, I worked for PwC. Things. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and, you know, she was she was a management consultant and, you know, right off the top, she's out on assignment working in a uh, aircraft manufacturing firm trying to teach them the difference between fixed and variable costs. Um, so it's it's not low level work that most of these um, elite students from elite schools are, are being involved in. I want to go back to the question on requisition volume, because I suspect um, that that may actually be one of the biggest problems challenging the, the Chris method, yep. um, because, and Chris, you, maybe you can ver verify this. I was going to ask you before you, the, 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 the tech kind of bumped you off, but uh, we're making the presumption that a university recruiter is going to have a lot more requisitions uh, compared to an experienced high recruiter. Is that true? And what are, what are those numbers on average I think, in your view? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think it definitely plays into what we're talking about, that whole slaughterhouse uh, effect. It's absolutely true. Um, everywhere I've been, university recruiting has had, uh, university recruiters have had more requisitions. Now, one could argue that uh, it's easier to find university talent than it is to find a 15 year senior yep. you know, tax audit uh, person. Have you. Now, the difference, though, that, that I find is that you as a recruiter have to approach it similar, right? You still have to have a proper outreach with with human aspect of it. You still have to work that candidate. Now, let me take a quick side step. The difference also is what company a university recruiter may work for. So myself i have always worked in a space where i'm full cycle that is the only thing i'm going to do you will not find me no offense to the facebook's and the googles of the world
but I personally am not going to go work there because you've got a setup person, you've got or a campus person, a setup person, a closer. Like as a candidate, what kind of experience is that? And that's one thing I always, you know, am, am very strong on is making sure that I'm following, I'm in a place where I can follow my candidates from the very beginning all the way through to the end and the offer. So as a recruiter, the environment may dictate a little bit of how you approach your job, but I think that regardless of where you work, you can still find that opportunity <clears throat> to make a personal connection. And as I mentioned earlier, like even texting my candidates, because how awesome, let me just give you a story and why I do this. How awesome is it as a student, you're sitting in a lecture and you get a text from me and I'm making you an offer at an Apple or a, or a Tesla or something like that. You're gonna be like, oh shit, this is awesome. And then you show it to your buddy, show it to your buddy. <laughs> and then next thing you know, you, you are um, a star. Right. So anyway, I, I will let Stephen kind of talk to that as well, but just want to kind of shed a little bit of answer and light on your question there, Hung. Totally agree. And, and then also, Chris, if you send a text to somebody like that and say, hey, congratulations, I'm extending an offer to you, you probably now are, are going to be the recipient of two or three good referrals. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Simple as that. But people don't want to put themselves out there. I can tell you that many. Oh, I should shouldn't say many, a lot of recruiters that I worked with personally over the years would absolutely never send out their personal uh, number to a candidate because right. they feel like they're scared to do that. Whereas I really flipped that on edge and I've seen a ton of success through that. Yeah, I've still- so, I, Tell me about, some, sorry guys, tell me about texting. Um, is, this, is this generational? Is, is, it, is it something that we need to, to learn to do as recruiters or is I, it something that you think would work with any kind of, uh, any kind of age group? I, absolutely, I, I personally believe texting helps. Um, I'm an Apple person, so I message on my laptop, super easy, right? Just copy that number. Even when it, my initial outreach, a lot of times to students will be a text. It won't be an email. One email gets buried. I get buried in email. I know how many unread emails I have and I, I can't get through them all. But if I can text, I can also communicate with that person if I'm taking my kids to school or if I'm coming out of the gym. Like, so it's that constant on. These students are always on 24 seven. So you have to figure out yep. a way to be able to get to them. And I feel like at least right now, texting helps me to have that leg up on other people. I'm gonna, I've just shared a link, textrecruit.com into, yep. the, into the chat stream there. Text Recruit is actually one of the sponsors of Recruiting Brain Food, so that's yep. a quick disclaimer here. <laughs> um, but they, are, they provide a product that actually allows people to uh, send text without necessarily using their personal phone. So if, if recruiters have a, a, a problem with confidentiality or something like this, you can actually use this service mm -hmm. Uh, in order to do it. And I think all of the texting services I've seen are from the US. So I wonder whether this is something that the US are ahead of us a little bit on. I, um, uh, because I, I do think it's gotta be effective, right? Yeah, I've got, I've got three kids that are sort of in the age group that we're talking about now. They're 20 to 24 years of age. And they, they would think it odd for a recruiter to not want to text with them. Um, but a couple of things that that I would add to that, um, I did see somebody posting a comment that something defective that email is dead, um, and it's absolutely not the case. That the data shows that there are actually more emails being sent by Gen Z or Z for those of you on the other side of the pond, um, and um, there and the open rates are increasing, the click through rates are increasing, so. Um, just like the folks from White Hat, I think Ewan was was made the point. He's obviously very passionate about apprenticeships and how White Hat approaches it. But he said he could not have been more clear about halfway through. It was just like, you know, this isn't the right thing for everyone. Um, you know, you, you have to have a bunch of different options. So candidates that want to be texted, awesome. But I'm sure, Chris, if somebody were to te text you back and say, you know what, hey, could you email me instead? You'd be hell yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, right. One of the one of the problems in the U.S. with texting um, is if you're not if you're not careful, you your company opens itself up to devastating financial penalties. Um, it's there's a five hundred to fifteen hundred dollar fine if you send bulk commercial texts, uh, and it's per text um, without proper permission and record keeping. So if you have you know, 10,000 applicants and you send out 10,000 texts and you know that you're not complying with the laws pr properly or your vendor that's sending those texts for you isn't complying. Um, you just open yourself up to a world of hurt. And that's the federal law, is it, uh, Steve? Yeah, <laughs> it's the same wow. law in the U.S. It's uh, TCPA, I think it's the same. It's the same law as the anti-junk faxing law. The courts wow. just wow. interpreted it to be the same. So 
text recruit, for example, um, <coughs> they wear, well, to, to, to grab the name from your previous guest, they wear a white hat. They're very, very careful and very, very ethical. You cannot go to a text recruit and say, hey, I want to recruit, you know, uh, people with a Bachelor of Arts in blah, blah, blah from these schools send our text for us. You can do that with email marketing using third party lists. But with text recruit, you have to use your own list and they're going to be looking at your permissions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think everyone's starting to, globally. People are starting to care a lot more about privacy and our ability to do all of these things. So um, I'm totally with you there. Um, guys, we're, we're running over uh, a, a little bit, um, so we might have to kind of um, move things along. We've got one more guest to, to bring on uh, to the show before we close. So I just want to thank you, uh, Steve, for your contribution. I know you're on holiday, by the way, so I really appreciate uh, you spending some extra time and, and jumping on the show. We'll definitely get you back to talk about programmatic as well a bit later. Um, and, and Chris... Uh, thank you for persevering with the tech man. I mean, I know it's <laughs> frustrating when you have to jump in and out, but great to learn a little bit more about your style. Um, and again, we, we definitely want to have a, a deeper dive into you know, how to get better at this university recruiting aspect. Um, yeah. Jens, there's a, have a, there's very, a lot have, of room for improvement. <laughs> indeed, I think I think we're beginning to find out. We're just scratching the surface of what we, yeah. can, mm -hmm. we can get better on. So, yeah. guys, um, great to have you. Um, we'll speak to you shortly. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Have a good one. Thanks. So, Hung, <clears throat> I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask the guys there. Uh, we do need to move on, but I was going to ask the guys when you're talking about text. I mean, are you specifically talking about SMS, or yeah. or would you do you include like WhatsApp and Messenger, for example, in in that as well? I personally distinguish the two. Um, yeah. I think uh, a text is SMS. It's literally through a mobile uh, sort of communicate. It's, it's through a telecoms provider. Um, uh, whereas WhatsApp, uh, Facebook chat, Instagram, I think that requires some sort of connection in advance. Um, and it's, it's, I would call that a chat message. Um, the main well, point is, Ruin is including WhatsApp on that. So, yeah, well, I mean, I would say it's slightly different. I mean, it's, uh, who knows? I mean, I, the technical, uh, in my own mind, I would, I would describe them differently. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, John seems to have probably a, a better view of it. Um, but let's bring Rowena on. She's been waiting very patiently, um, and, I, and I'm definitely very excited to uh, to speak to Rowena about her views. Um, oh, there's two Rowenas on here. How do I do this? Um, I think it's this one. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just to address the pick up the phone side, uh, someone on chat mentioned, hey, it's okay to pick up the phone. I think the main thing here is that phone forces synchronicity and I think the younger generation reject that. Um, they want yeah, to be able to... I said it. I was only joking. Yeah, was it you? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, people... I, p young people are happy to talk in a synchronous environment, but it has to be prearranged. You can't just interrupt yes. them. No. Um, that's the last you thing they want to do. Me. I don't want to do that now. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I'm just not interested. Oh. In, somebody calls me, and I'm not there. Uh, sorry, and I'm not expecting their call. I'm like, I'm, I, feel, I honestly feel like... It's that's a bit rude. Food. Yeah, yeah, it's rude. It's, a, it's an intrusion. It's an assertion. I yeah. mean, I had this argument with Gareth Jones, my good friend Gareth Jones, uh, CEO of Head, Head Start, who you can have an argument with. Um, but he was like, pick up the phone. And I was saying, look, it's an unacceptable assertion of priorities. Like, I might have something on, you decided to interrupt my day. Uh, you're basically asserting your priority over yeah. my, my priority. Yeah. Not acceptable. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Um, so never call me again, Gareth. Anyway, um, moving, <laughs> moving on to that. He never does anyway. That's fine. Although, by um, the way, you, I, I'm not sure if you were aware, but you butt called me last night. Uh, did I really? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was like, How was you the actual phone? Anybody who, who ever receives a message? phone call, anybody who re receives a phone call from me, it's almost always a butt dial. I never dial yeah. up. Um, so anyway. Do you know what you can do instead? Is you leave voice notes. Don't bother uh, yeah, phoning. Yeah, does. Voice he notes. Does. Yeah. Your, I, I, I kind of leave way. video. I leave video notes now, so yeah, I, instead, I think that's the way. This is a new way yeah. to talk. Yeah, anyway, exactly. Rowena, how are you doing? Thanks for being Good. patient. I know you've been oh, sitting there. it's been there. great. You've been enjoying it. Tap 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 it away. Yeah. Great. Well, listen. Can you introduce yourself and who do you work for, Rowena? Yes, of course. So, um, Rowena Bark. I work for TMP. We are um, a recruitment marketing agency, but we also extend into RPO. My role is to really try and influence the market to change how recruitment happens. Um, I have a background in learning and talent and future talent recruitment, but I specialize in generational theory. So Gen Z behavior, 
um, as it plays out in recruitment and development. Um, particularly, my hotspot at the moment is whether those generational trends play out for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. My hypothesis that I'm doing some research on now um, is that it doesn't relate to people from challenged backgrounds or who haven't been exposed to privilege, but I'm, I will let you know what I find out. Okay, so wow. we should we should have brought you on right at the beginning of the show, Lorena. Really. I, I, I had no idea that you had this kind of cool. academic insight as well. So I'm going to let you do most of the talking here. Give us some of these findings that you've you've discovered in your research about these generational cohorts, because uh, I'm a big defender of hey, listen, you can probably describe broad in broad strokes people's generation generationally they behave differently and yeah. I, I, agree, I get a lot of crap for that but you tell me if i'm right or wrong um from your research rowena yeah there are there are generational trends the thing that people misunderstand and get quite fiery about is that they think it's only for a certain group depending on the years that you're born which yeah. is not true it, that doesn't play out um, you have baby boomers um, with the same passions and concerns as you have with a 15 year old. Um, you know, this, these are baby boomers who have got million pound homes and are of, of very specific political views who a 15 year old in Bradford who is trying to work out what, what they should do, where they should do what their parents say. Um, they've both been exposed to some of the challenges in global turmoil, economic upheaval. They've seen people lose jobs, gain homes, lose homes. Um, they, they've learned how to understand technology. They've learned how to express themselves through technology. So generational trends absolutely exist. Um, the key is just not assuming that it's only for a certain group of people. Tell us about some of these trends, Rowena. So what are the characteristics? Like, what does that look yeah. like? Yeah. Um, so a really good one is looking at trust. So 12 to 24 year olds, now, um, uh, Gen Z goes back a little bit further, but if we start thinking about 12, 24 olds, because then they're this is the career space, um, they have a different relationship with companies to your 50 to 60 olds or even your millennials, the, the group just before. They want to understand their own importance in relation to that company. So when they're buying on the high street or when they are talking with their parents or deciding whether or not to face up to the police officer that's walking down the street, they approach it from a place of how, how, to what degree can I trust that person, entity, piece of advice, and how do I then respond in action to it? So this plays out in recruitment where you've seen, um, you know how all these big organizations used to talk about impact, mm -hmm. our social impact, this is what we do, trying to help people get fired up about the mission. The difference is now, um, have you actually made change, tangible change based on that, that I can then trust as a candidate and as a young mm -hmm. person? Because so they're these, more skeptical. They, they've got a sort yeah. of, they, they do more due diligence on this. They don't immediately trust the big brand because it's a big brand. They want to have a, they want evidence. They want evidence and they want to understand um, how they can then impact that evidence going forward. And they want to understand whether they're going to be safe because of this evidence means, are they likely to be, can we get through a recession? Are they going to be all right? They might not know what a recession is. They might not say, I'm worried about recession. But ultimately, they want a career where they're going to be safe. This is a big thing right now. Safety. Fascinating, yeah. Mm. Um, and you think it's because they've grown up uh, with the last 10, 15 years, they've seen a financial crash, they've seen people lose jobs, maybe their parents or people at the older generation, and, and they've, just, they've, they've witnessed how it can be. Um, yes. so they've got and this they don't touch concern. money anymore, really. Okay. It's all digital. So their, their understanding about what salary and money means is completely different. So the notion of being paid for work doesn't have the same resonance. This is why they don't work, you know, they, they'll work until the end of the day and then they'll go. But they're still like your number one employee. They just won't work all hours because you, everyone used to work all hours. They're, the, sort of the, 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 um, the instant transactional turnover of information that they have access to plays out in how they do their work and how they make their career choices. It's quite fascinating, especially when you think about these guys are going to lead businesses in five, ten years' time. They're going to be making business decisions in transactional ways with a different value set around safety and trust. And 
I, I want you to keep talking, Rowena. Um, uh, this is amazing. Um, uh, I don't know whether you feel the same, Adam, but I'd love to see Rowena continue to talk about these trends. I mean, what, what else are you seeing? We've seen trust. Um, uh, we've, go on. Um, what else is useful to understand? There's a huge piece around, uh, so trust in relationships. There's a huge piece around technology and um, intersectionality around diversity and inclusion. So this, um, somebody mentioned it earlier on in the chat and they were absolutely right. Um, uh, they want to know, these, these young people curate themselves online. They are not, there's no coming of age moment anymore. There's no Stand By Me movie. Um, this yeah. is, they are, they have been curated by their parents. The average yeah. five year old has got 2000 photos of them displayed publicly without their permission at the moment. Their personality is being defined for them based on other choices. So as they grow, wow. um, as, that's Gen Alpha, but the, the Gen Zs that we're talking about, they are deciding how and who they share themselves with the world. So what this means is they're looking for organizations that can allow them to develop that. So someone was talking about training and development. Yes, because what training and development stands for in their mind is constant evolution of self. They've gone on a journey of, of opinion forming. So they are looking for places, if they're gonna make a choice between one amazing employer and another amazing employer, they're gonna choose based on how can they best become themselves and be themselves more um, in a role. So I know it sounds really academic, so to bring it back to reality and recruitment and what do you do with this information, which basically means that when you're doing your recruitment process is you really need to think about in that, uh, I think it was Chris and Chris and Steve talking about it earlier on, that personal touch is about knowing, getting to know what they're worried about and how to support them to be better at it. So if you have a young um, uh, woman of color who is going through your accountancy recruitment process, um, how she will be questioning consciously or unconsciously, um, whether she's going to be comfortable and whether she's going to fit in you need to help her within her, without making assumptions navigate that nervousness like one in three students suffer from depression anxiety or a combination of the two as they go through their recruitment processes the employers have this massive opportunity to help this audience become better than themselves through this one recruitment process and just on that note, I mean, we often forget how traumatic actually a recruitment process can be uh, for yeah. anybody, never mind a young person. Um, yeah. I mean, Steve mentioned the metaphor of a slaughterhouse. I don't quite think it's there, but it's 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 similar, right? It, it's it's it will be human beings being processed. It's very uncomfortable. Oftentimes, you're in competition with people who might also get the job ahead of you. How is that going to be a good experience? So all of these uh, are additional psychological stresses that. I can imagine a company, if they're smart, if they were able to design a recruitment process that, that took away some of this stress mm -hmm. uh, and took away some of this process, that they could actually be a huge differentiator for, 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 uh, for this Absolutely. type of talent. The best example I've seen recently is Amazon, who've scrapped the whole process in for some of their recruitment areas, and they just have an immersive situational judgment type environment. No gamification, no rubbish, just really get to understand the role, understand yourself as you go through that and then just get the job. This sounds amazing. Can you tell me more about this immersive experience? I don't actually know much more than that. I found out about it last week. I've got another coffee with Rui in uh, two weeks time to find out a bit more about how they do it. So right. I'll, I'll have to come who, back. I'll bring whoever, Rui. Who, bring him on um, because we need to know. This is exactly yeah. the sort of thing I think would work um, because you just it's a, it's a closer to the real world environment. Um, everything that is yeah. an assessment is basically uh, an abstraction of what this person should be doing. Mm. Uh, and an ab abstraction is yeah. going to be it's going to be corrupted in some way. So this is a fascinating experiment. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, just to close, I know we're running out of time, but to bring full circle on the conversation that we started with today, we were talking about what's the value of university experience. You guys all probably know that young people are doing less and less work experience because it's been cut from the school's mandatory setup. It's not mandatory for school children to do work experience anymore. So it depends on all sorts of other factors. So they're coming into the recruitment process with less and less examples of that we would look for in to show what they know and what they do. So the point of asking like those culture fit questions, I'm kind of getting into it because you're trying to understand who they are, but I, I too hate culture fit. But you need to help them 
do what it takes in the job and see if they like it, see if they can do it and get to know them in the process because they don't have the examples to pull on. No, that's a, that, that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in recruitment. Like, how do we move away from these artificial assessments? Um, as you mentioned, gamification, psychometric testing, technical testing, all of these types of things. Um, uh, that is not what the job is. Um, we're trying to guess or, or pull signals from these abstractions and then trying to figure out whether this is the right fit or not. We yeah. need to just get them closer to the job. Um, yeah, exactly. And both of them will be much more comfortable making assessments as to whether they're the right fit or not if we're able to do that. So I think yeah. that's going to be a, a really interesting sandbox for some innovative company to try and uh, play around with. Somebody asked about um, a question. I didn't see what it was. Was what, Would you say the company should redefine itself as companies that advocate mindfulness and mental health? Oh, yes. Um, Absolutely. I just wrote an article, um, it's going out soon for another um, company, Meet and Engage, about mental health support through technology. And yes, they should. It, it's a, an absolute because um, I saw some stats from Student Minds yesterday um, saying that it's like 20 in 200 students suffer from, I think I mentioned it just now, the depression, anxiety and all this stuff. They need support, they need help. Um, this is a fascinating stuff, Ruina. I want to ask you a question about what employers could do. Um, you know, really, the, the, if they were going to become, if they're committed to the idea of becoming the best type of employer to this new generation coming through, what would your recommendations be for them? Um, a great question. Not to fear change. The biggest blocker I see in implementing programs that truly benefit all the candidates, the tens of thousands of applications that go through for apprenticeship and graduate programs, maybe just for one employer, other companies that get over the fear of change. Uh, it is 80, my phone's got to fall over, it's about 80% internal comms and galvanizing the business to understand that you need to shift how you communicate with these young people to allow that personalized conversation to give support and talk about mental health, to um, recognize that intersectionality is the new description of diversity you have to overcome the fear of change in order to get results and I think that is um, where recruitment and learning and organ learning an OD is I, I now span these two worlds they need to come together it's been separate for too long what do you a final question for you Rowena before I let you go um, what is the most common mistake that you've seen um, employers make even if they have the will and they want to do this um, what, what kind of common errors have you spotted um, that you think, you know what, bad execution on this one? Um, a couple of things. Companies that are still including personal data in application forms. I mean, just ditch it. There's no reason. Um, there's a common mistake that uh, they think it's sufficient to go on campus and that will enough to create a relationship. That doesn't work. You need to have an experience, digital and um, face to face. I so think, very okay, quickly on that. A few seconds to think. I think the whole thing is treat candidates as consumers. Really understand that there's a process, an emotional process that you go through about making a career decision and joining a company. So if you don't think of it that way, it's a huge mistake. Yeah, it's a big massive shift. Um, it's not transactional. Let's just swap it. Um, great. Um, Adam, you want to say something? Well, the reason I've been quiet for the last ten minutes is because. Um, I mean, I've been really, really fascinated with everything Ruin has said. And I think, Hung, we definitely need to do a show that is specifically about, that's not actually to do with recruitment, it's actually to do with just this whole issue around demographic cohorts, because you and I have been have been in agreement about it. They definitely exist, and there's definitely ways to adapt because you know they exist, but a lot of people don't like this. It sounds like Rowena knows more about it than anybody I've met, um, is, the, is the first thing. I do love this yeah. stuff. I no, yeah. I, I think you're right. We need to get Rowena back if you'll have us um, and, and really talk about these cohorts because we have to care about it as, as recruiters. We have to care about it as, 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 as people. Um, yeah. more, because more when you've, as people. We've got a new generation coming in and, and yeah. um, uh, we need to, uh, uh, even from a, a selfish point of view, if we want to build up the best companies we can, we need to have a much deeper understanding as to what these uh, this younger generation really thinks and feels. Um, and the worst thing we could do is kind of layer on some cosmetic stuff um, that will that will kind of 
it'll be uh, not authentic and it'll be uh, it'll be uh, rightly disparaged by the, the by the people who would uh, who are coming into the workforce uh, in in the, in the coming future. Okay, uh, listen, well, go ahead. Two, two more quick questions for Rowena. First is yep. um, a couple of people have I put on the chat. Where do we find your work? So. Do you have a blog or something like that? Or No, I don't. I probably should start one. I write for TMP. They have an insights page. Um, yep. I rant a lot on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best thing because yep. um, that's where I'm, start I'm starting to try and put my voice out there more on and share this information more. Um, okay. Any feedback on things that you wanted, wanted me to write about, I'm all ears. That would yeah. help me build a content plan or something. Oh, yeah, so I'll tell you what. You've got plenty to say. And yeah, we should we, we should do it. we should do a special show like an ask me anything and have Rowena just uh, deal with that because um, I think everyone is everyone I think I can see um, is very uh, motivated to hear more from you. But unfortunately, we're running out of time uh, and we have to cut it short. So one more question, Adam, one, go ahead. Last oh, one. Yeah, last one. I've, I've got to ask. I've got to. I've got to ask Lee's question. Uh, are, so, are you related to Johann Sebastian? <gasps> oh, do you know what? <laughs> Well, <laughs> no, we're Bachs on the Polish side. My grandfather did a big book of Bachs, and um, sadly not. Uh, <laughs> Good uh, question. The yeah. only disappointing answer that you've given in the entire yes, show. Really. <laughs> um, so listen, um, thank you so much for your time and your patience. I really Pleasure. wish we had more time with you. And yeah. Adam was correct. Okay. We're going to do a special show and get you on it yeah. as a solo player because I think we definitely yeah. need to know more. Um, I hope you have a very good, good weekend, Rowena. Um, Thanks and, for having uh, me. I've loved this. It's been great. It's really made my week. Yeah. That's fantastic to hear. And we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll hopefully see you soon. Um, so that's about it. How amazing were the guests today? Um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. It was fantastic. Um, and you know what? I came in thinking I was ignorant. I was confirmed. Um, yep. So my ignorance is confirmed, which is always a good thing. I've even learned a lot during the course of the hour or so we've been yep. um, on the show, but I still have so much more further to go. So I definitely need to revisit this and start speaking to these uh, uh, to, to guests like we had today. Um, it's very, very important. Um, Definitely. There's just one thing I wanted to add, which is it, it's all backed up my, I've got a theory, which is that companies, and Rowena just said it, companies need to blend recruitment with their learning and development programs, and they need to build relationships with candidates from the minute they enter the workforce till the day they retire. And the way to do that is by constantly developing people, whether they're working for your organization or there are or periods where they're not working, they're working for somebody else. So well, th this is actually year, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is actually a, a a a quote that our good friend Bill Borman uses. You know, like, you got to maintain the relationship with the person, never not the candidate. Don't re retain the relationship, don't retain the candidate, because you know what, this person is going to oscillate in and out of your business, and they'll yeah. probably end up. If you have a great relationship with someone, they'll probably end up delivering services to you in multiple different facets as an employee, Absolutely. as a contractor, as a boomerang hire. As an advisor of some sort, yeah, um, nice. so yeah, this is all along. Ho hopefully, you know, recruitment is pointing in the right direction in, in all of this. But mm -hmm. hey, it's a journey. We've got a place to go. So anyway, yeah. Adam, been great to see you. Um, enjoy your holiday next week. I want to hear about yeah. Cornwall. Um, uh, everyone, thank you so much for your uh, for your time and your energy. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to give a, a week, uh, sort of a miss next week because. Not only is Adam away, but it's Wreckfest on Thursday, and I don't fancy my chances to be around on Friday um, in any kind of state to do a show. You'll still um, be at Wreckfest. You'll still be at Wreckfest. I, I will day. probably, I will probably still be at Wreckfest. So if you're going to Wreckfest on Thursday, please come and visit the Brain Food stage. Uh, we're going to have our own special stage. I'll be on there all uh, all day, um, and come up and say hello. Otherwise, we'll be back in two weeks' time uh, with another great show with another bunch of guests. So thank you very much. Everyone have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.